Hi everyone and welcome to um, our Furnace webinar of Surge Protection Devices with Furnace. Um, we do, before we start, we do have uh, three poll questions just for the general audience. Just we're trying to gauge how familiar you are with SPDs Lightning Protection, probably more for us as well. Um, haven't done polls before, so here it goes. Uh, question number one. Um, That would be, have you had experience with SPDs? Um, please answer as you see fit there. Okay, um, almost 50% have voted. Uh, wait a bit more. All right. Um, okay, uh, it's a bit slow, I guess. We're waiting a bit for uh, the responses. Okay, um, just uh, type not sure if you're not sure, obviously. Um, you haven't dealt with SPDs before. Probably a good one, 70% voted. We'll wait a bit more on there. Okay, um, okay 70 Five percent voted. I guess uh, we have a bit of shy audience today, but that's all right. Um, uh, we do have a majority answered yes. That's fifty-three percent, forty no, and seven percent not sure. That's an interesting response. Um, let's go with question number two. So this is probably. Um, this should have been the first one, but in general, this is just asking if you ever have considered over voltage protection, especially for the end customers, not just SPDs. Um, it'd be interesting to know how that goes as well. Probably should have been the first one anyway, but yeah. Okay. 45% um, voted, 50%, that's good. Um, Getting a bit slow. This is in general voltage protection, not just surge protection, probably protection of cables, placement devices, and things like that. We'll wait a bit more. So you it's about 54% yes and 50% yes and 43 no. So 50-50 in a way. Interesting response there. Uh, we will wait a bit more, it's still coming. All right, it's probably that we all. all right, so 53% yes, 40% no, and 7 unsure. Interesting response. And lastly, uh, I'll, I'll do this quickly. Have you ever installed SPDs with Furnace before? Um, that should be a quick one there, I guess. All right, so. 40% uh, voted, 82% um, no. Um, okay, we'll wait a bit more to see how we're going to go down. Okay, so 60% um, voted, 85% no, and 15 yes. That means it's going to be a good webinar. At least we're going to learn something regarding Fronius and SPDs and how that can work together. I'll just close the poll now. Um, and we'll start the webinar as such. Okay, so um, today your team is myself, um, the technical advisors, here's from Australia and Sam, my colleague. G'day. How are you, everyone? Um, as mentioned, we'll be covering surge protection with Fronius inverters. Um, the content uh, that we're going to look at today it's it's broadly split in three categories one is general introduction which is actually labeled lightning surges and challenges uh, which highlights surge protection as a factor of safety there um, some country requirements that are local to australia uh, some standards that are applicable although that's not all of them um, and some funny solutions that can be deployed with our inverters as well 
Okay, so let's start. Lightning surges and challenges. Um, what is it? What does it all mean? I guess lightning. It's 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 an interesting term that um, that's been going on for quite a long time now. But what is lightning, and what actually happens in in, in case of lightning strike? Um, I mean, in general, we all know lightning as current. Um, what it, it does when you do have a hit, it's what produces transient surges. And we all know they're unpredictable, they're not periodic, so you can't actually know how the waveform will look, which actually are mainly currents from the main strike, but then through EMF, they do generate voltage as well. So in general, you probably can look at a lightning strike or flash. Um, you can split it into a main leader or leader charge, we then can be divided with the charge buildup and the main actual discharge itself, which can then have several side flashes as well. Generally, it's split in, in, into main categories based on the current time length, usually in um, impulse current and long time currents as well. There's some reference on the right side. This came from um, a German which which actually analyzed lightning strikes and flashes, how it all looked like. But the main point that this is trying to get across is that lightning strike can a very destructive force, obviously, but but it's the long-term component that's actually the most damaging part, just because of the timing sequence there, which doesn't happen always. Just something to be aware of. Um, just a, just a general, I guess, overview there, uh, flash density of the world and how we compare. We see Australia is not the worst. Um, compared to the world, obviously. Um, some general statistic, a bit of green, but uh, there's on average 16 people killed by lightning every year in Australia only, which is not really that good, I guess. Um, how, being in the PV industry, how this applies to us? Um, I guess everyone's well aware with this graph here. Uh, basically, this comes from the solar PV standard, 5033 2014. Right side of it, it's what you currently have in the standard. Left is the actual same flash density map from the government website, which has been updated. And you'll see, maybe not as obvious because they use more shades now, but the flash density has increased for Australia and probably within the next version of the standard, this will get updated as well. But um, let's let's see how we go. Anyway, just, just for information. Um, so typically with a PV system, there's a, there's a two examples of PV system there, a typical house mount system and a ground mount. Um, in general, lightnings when, from PV manufacturer point of view, we look at equipment and over voltage and how that can cause damage to the actual equipment itself. But in general, you have um, four distinct sources of lightning over voltage. Uh, direct, indirect, in, and the last one is temporal voltages. So direct, indirect is what we actually see, the lightning strikes. Direct uh, lightning strikes is where you actually get hit by a lightning strike on the actual system itself. On the picture here on top, right top, you'll see an actual house which does have a lightning protection system, which is not that common in Australia, although it can be seen. Indirect is it's, it's a tricky one because this doesn't happen does necessarily have to happen in the direct vicinity of the house itself. What I mean by that, it can actually happen in the cloud, but because you're close to it, it will generate voltage in the nearby vicinity of the actual source, which will generate over voltage. Also, at potential rise, this means that if you do have a lightning strike in the nearby neighborhood in a way, uh, because usually um, that will be covered under one transformer. This can cause potential rise on the main earthing conductor there on the whole transformer, which can cause over voltage as well. The last one, and probably not as, I guess, obvious, um, this comes from the grid itself. That, what this means is that when you have large loads coming in or going off the grid, it can impact the actual voltage as well, which can result in a voltage spike or dip from the network. In our case, it will be over voltage. Just be cautious that lightning strike are not the only source of over voltage and surges as well. So surges, it's an interesting phenomena. Uh, 
generally um, they're classed as transient over voltages which can cause several tens of thousand kilovolts if not more this is on the receiving side we're not talking about the source um, and the most destructive source of surges is direct strikes if, as we've um, covered uh, in the slide a bit above Interesting statistic there, almost 85% of the surges that are recorded statistically, that which not generally in all of them, but they're below 35 kiloamp um, of current, which is doesn't it's a lot, but in terms of surge, it doesn't seem seem like quite a lot. Um, I guess two broad categories, how they can be classed. Um, if you have a direct surge hit and indirect as well. In general, this is how SPDs will be divided as well, but you're looking at something called 10, 350 and 820 microseconds. This is broadly characteristic which defines how uh, surge protection devices or devices that affect surges will, will respond to them. And in general, it has to do with how much energy they'll absorb, uh, hence the seconds there. Um, and surges... AC surges usually are the most common frequent cause of damage to, um, to equipment. Um, and usually, as we all know, equipment that increase sensitivity um, are more at risk of damage. Um, again, um, surges can cause serious consequences to damage to equipment and, and fire as well, uh, which is not to be sidelined, really. Um, just a few quick uh, graphs there. Um, so voltage and, 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 and current graphs, they're not predictable, which means you typically have a peak and dissipation period, which is largely um, described by the 10, 350 and 820 microsecond uh, characteristic there, which somehow, uh, they're the standards that do address this, but just for information, it does look like something shown on the right hand side. And the last graph I do want to show there, just be aware that the AC voltage itself can vary quite a bit. So in Australia, nominally it's 230, 400, it should be. But uh, depends on the time frame as well. So for very brief timing, say 10 or 1 millisecond, that can swing well above the defined limits. Quick graph shows how that relates on the right side there. Just for your reference, that voltage can swing way above the nominal limits. So um, a bit of statistics, um, surges, as we said before, that the most frequent cause of damage to power electronics. Um, depends on the electronics we look at, some are more sensitive, some not. But in general, surges amount to 61% of damage to the power electronic equipment itself. The source here is Aviva, which is a German statistic um, uh, provider. Uh, unfortunately, in Australia, it's a bit hard to get one, but uh, Still, it's 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 a good data to use as well. Um, how does this relate to PV systems? Um, they, um, I'm just going to skip a slide. But in general, um, surges um, doesn't amount to a lot of damage to actual PV systems themselves. You can see on the graph there, it's like actually 18%. But be aware, sometimes it's hard to class surges because when over voltage hits a system, it's sometimes a bit hard to determine the actual cause of it. Um, but still, um, surge protection is, is a major part of protecting the device themselves. So as such, it should not be um, discarded straight away. So it definitely should be included in a system as, as itself. Just be aware that um, our inverters, not just ours, but in general, inverters do come with overall protection by itself. Um, so surge is just extra layer of protection, which may be needed on with some customers. We'll go over what's needed, what's not a bit later. Just a, just a, um, I guess, general overview of the system itself. Um, so going further, there's a a quick slide on how surge in terms of current looks on our system. Uh, so the gray graph there represents the surge itself. The black uh, dissipating, uh, it's a bit dissipating compared to the actual surge, but the black sort of characteristic comes from um, our internal um, over voltage protection devices, which is, we refer to, to them as MOVs, we probably met before. 
and then the the pink looking graph is coming from SPD device themselves. The reason why this is there, just you can have a visualization how that current looks in terms of time or if you like energy as well. So surges take energy much quicker in terms of the time frame of the length of the surge compared to any other over voltage protection devices. So, I mean, I guess when there's multiple challenges when one considers overworld protection and SPDs and such. And um, I guess one of the biggest factors that needs to be considered is that we are trying to maximize, or you as a, I guess, installer, so integrators trying to maximize the, the safety for your customers. And just you gotta be aware that a system that has been designed, installed, and does have SPDs does not guarantee 100% uh safety rate it does increase increase that factor which which is what we're trying to get across but you can never get across to obviously the 100 percent. so so in a way we're trying to manage to reduce the risk that's imposed to the system itself so all the spds and all protections are there to protect uh the system itself by minimizing the risk but as you you well aware that risk can never be completely removed unfortunately so um, there's multiple, I'd say, bubble options that we're going to present here, but um, multiple ways how, how we can actually attack the, uh, the, the, the challenge of world protection. Uh, one is, um, so the first factor, I, obviously, we've mentioned there that we're maximizing the um, probability or minimize the probability of the actual fault occurring on the device by installing SPDs. Um, one way you can also approach it is to use um, potential equalization or, or bonding on, on the side itself. Again, um, this all is closely related to actual insurance. Um, so the less the risk in Europe, at least at the moment, not sure with how this is getting translated in Australia at the moment, but still the, the more chances, the, the less risk you have on a site the premiums for insurance will become less. At least that's the general expectation. Hopefully that's getting across. You're more than welcome to share um, feedback with us if that's the case or not. Again, um, adding SPDs does um, increase the protection for the devices, in our case for the inverters, which does increase the factor of safety for the system itself. And the, the best way to do forward, we do um, have some options there in place with allow you to have simple refitting um, instructions um, which are specific to us in a way. Um, going forward again uh, we'll look at this graph a bit just to get a general overview and get a feel how the actual system looks and where we can actually implement things. Um, have a good look and in, in, in the house there um, as presented here this is actually coming from the standard 5033. So we will talk a bit more later, but the reason across with uh, that we want to communicate here is that um, the lightning damage or the risk we can see, at least from equipment point of view, is over voltage. We can come from four sources, as described previously. It can be direct strike, indirect strikes, earth potential rise, and temporary over voltages. So in a way, if you look at, um, uh, the picture there you'll see that the general entrances that can happen is the roof and the actual supply line for ac supply line as well as the ac earthing on the actual house itself the inverter does sit in a way in house which means that the general input that the risk that can come is from the roof or from the actual ac lines or from the actual earth lines again a protection uh, this this comes from the actual sources of damage in a way if you want to think about it so one way you can reduce the risk you can introduce lightning potential bonding on site you can avoid doing uh, loops the more loops you do you can uh, as the as the actual um, voltage is getting increased in the air it's actually inducing more voltage you want to avoid that with your dc cabling and ac as well one is airspeed installation and the other, the last one is shielding of cables as well uh, by putting in trays or any other methods. The reason why SPD is, is bolded there, I just want to highlight that the SPD is not the only way to do, to provide overvolt protection. It's just obviously one of the methods this can be achieved um, going forward. 
Um, some key, I guess, um, information coming from the realm, realm of standards here. And, and what I'm just going to read it quickly. It, this is coming from the standard itself. It just says that the installation of PV on a building does, does have negligible effect on probability of direct lightning strike, but does not necessarily imply the LP should not be installed if, if none exists. This is coming from the lightning standard, which is 1768. You're more than welcome to have read through it. Um, but it does also say if the actual array does change the characteristic of a building in a prominent way, then then it, the whole lighting protection system should be reassessed. But I guess that's something to think about. Uh, that means if the LPS system is present. Um, what what it's important to note, a lot of people do ask the question, well, do installing panels attract more lightning? Whether my house will become more prevalent lightning strong, things like that. It hasn't by now, we haven't seen any concrete evidence that installing a PV system will attract, will, will cause your house or your building to attract more lightnings. So you shouldn't treat it as such. Although the lightning protection concept and the re reduction of risk is always there. So installation of SPDs and other methods of reduction of that risk should always be considered as good practice anyway. Um, so I guess. The four pillars we've touched briefly is um, are mentioned briefly here as well. This is all coming from the standards themselves. More than welcome to read. But um, I guess we have the grounding and potential equalization, the random cables, existing LPS systems, and how that can affect our system as well, and internal protection, um, which is SPD themselves. So. One thing is uh, you got to make sure when you install electrical system that the health of the existing system is, is in check. I mean, when we say health, we mean the equipment building in place, the, the earthing rod, the whole system there that's installed as it is, it's healthy. And then um, when we actually install our system, we haven't actually changed that system in a way. Because if you think about it, if, if the main earthing conductor is rusty, the main electro road is not effective, then it will be the, the, the weakest link in the chain. So it doesn't matter what we do really, it, it's all going to come down to that, which will impose resistance in that low resistance loop, which will result high voltage and damage throughout the system as well. Cable routing, uh, this should be relatively straightforward. I mean, um, the standards do cover this quite a bit, so avoid loops, avoid um, binding of cables together. One thing that's this interesting one as well, they do mention separation from lighting protection system if in place. So in order to avoid side flashes, if 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 lightning strike does occur on the LPS as such, which we're going to see a bit more. So um, lighting protection system, it does look a bit on the right side. This, this, this image is coming from Europe, I have to be honest. Haven't managed to get a LPS in Australia. Probably they are, but... Um, yeah, so you're more than welcome to share some more information if you do one on that. Usually lightning protection comes with multiple subsystems there as well. You have the interception system, you have resters, you have the down conductors and the connection to the actual um, earthing rod as well. So when you think about install PV system there, you need to think about how to, you're going to integrate that not just with the electrical system, also with the LPS system as well. What requirements there might be there with that? One, just a tip there, the minimum distance there for side flashes, but that's not the only one, obviously. Um, it's it's a bit of a difficult one. Usually residential, you wouldn't be seeing this as much, mostly commercial, and there are consultants that do design light protection systems. If you think there's, there's a bit of cause for concern there, you can always consult light protection experts. Um, in, in, in how this should be tackled going forward. Um, so uh, internal lighting protection. So typically SPDs are the option there that can be deployed for that. Um, uh, SPD stands for safe protection devices, obviously, and usually there's a technology that um, equalizes the potential to the actual line potential that you have at the moment. Um, by bridging it. We'll see a bit more shortly how that's done, but just, just I guess, general idea that SPDs can uh, fulfill that function. 
Um, this is just informational, I guess, slide there. Um, when, when equipments are connected to the grid, they have to maintain or sustain voltage surges anyway, uh, which, which closely resembles the graph we've covered previously where the, the grid voltage can change quite a bit in very quick periods. So all equipment should maintain or sustain some surges anyway. Our inverters are rated for of voltage category of two for DC and three for AC, uh, which you can see on the right side, it relates to these sort of um, surge voltages. It's it's basically fixed, so just it's just more informational that the devices do come with sustained um, uh, capability, capabilities inbuilt um, anyway. So um, this is just a I guess brief introduction there, um, but let's have a look at, at how more specifically this reflects to us. Um, the the biggest applicable standard uh, for PV systems here locally is as NZS uh, 2003 2014 version for PV, obviously. Um, and as you know, like um, this is this standard and, and the Lightning standard are closely related with IC standard, which we do look at as well, being international. But locally, um, main chiefly there's three main standards that do address this. Um, S3000 uh, slash NZ, sorry, as we all know, which is one of those, do address this. 5033, um, which do uh, list some recommendations for world protection as well. And the lightning protection standard, as we have in Australia uh, and New Zealand as well, which is 1S67, 2007 version. I will briefly touch on topics, how they cover, how they uh, they relate, but mostly we'll focus on 5033. So um, the requirements for all three, if um, you, they're listed in under section 3.5, um, um, obviously protection against effects of lightning or voltage. Um, and the interesting concept there was subsection uh, 0.2, which actually is protection under overall surges. It states that for residential buildings in a location where lightning Flash density is more than two. It's recommended, and just a general, um, I guess, relation to that. S3000 section 371, which is also lists protection against over voltage. It does say that over voltage protection should be provided in areas where lightning is prevalent. I guess prevalent, you can depends how you, I guess, interpret that as well. But the general concept there is that for residential properties where the lightning flash is quite a bit, uh, say Darwin had Brisbane or some other areas, then you should start considering over voltage protection, not just SPDs, obviously. So again, um, we've mentioned this, but the standard also lists how you can do protection against over voltage surges. And uh, there's four, chiefly four methods. Um, the standard list as well. Uh, I'll just go through them: lightning for potential bonding, avoidance of analogs, installation on SPD devices, and shielding. This this means of shielding of cables. Um, so we're not really going to cover in detail the other three methods because the whole point of the presentation is going to SPDs and how that integrate with phone devices. But the whole point there is just trying to make you aware that SPD is part of the umbrella of world protection, but it's not the only method to go forward. And the do need to pay a bit of attention with the other concepts as well. For example, if there's no bonding or if there's no shielding, if you rely only on SPDs, then the risk is not as generally reduced as, as it could be, which means the SPD should do all the work now. And in general, system will be at more risk of over voltage damage. Um, Okay, so SPDs is an interesting concept. Um, there's the, the chiefly four categories for SPDs. Uh, they'll be classed as such. Uh, this is coming from the Lightning Protection Standard, uh, 1768, I believe, 2007, I believe it was. So usually you'll see the gas discharge devices, spark gaps, MOVs, and solid state devices, or a combination of such. Our inverters introduce solid state devices, uh, and uh, actually, no, sorry, that's MOVs, which baristas. Uh, on the AC side, and usually if that blows, there will be an overvoltage coming on the AC side. Um, just so you know, um, SPDs. I mean, there's, there's multiple characteristics on how to specify SPDs and their configurations. This is again covered in the Lightning Standard, but in general, you're looking at working modes. What are you trying to protect? Um, 
the, do they require circuit protection on the cable itself? What voltage level are they protecting? What's the message level they can take? And what's the actual working current? Uh, an interesting photo I've put on the right side. This is surge protection before and after um, when it works. And And, and, and obviously, after, so top search actually actively deploying. Uh, not as obvious, but this is affecting the working mode and SPD. You have um, shunt and series. What that means, um, it's are you protecting between the actives and that, or just between the actives? With us and in general with DC, you will be looking at both operation modes in play. I just wanted to briefly say there, this is obviously shown for AC. If you look at DC, it will be actually the same. Neutral will be, say, minus. L will be plus. The, the method will be the same. Just be aware when it just activates, it actually makes a short between that line it protects and there. So this is where I stated before, the health of the earth protection system comes into play. So, for example, if that resistance is too high, then the voltage on the surge will become too high anyway, and it will go down the line, so it will be less effective. Going forward, um, so with, again, coming to the house picture again, um, there's these four prevalent factors when you have when in solar systems, and specifically this is so where you have to choose a, a search protection device that needs to be looked at, which chiefly guides the choice for the SPD device itself. Mostly, you would pinpoint this down to four options. So it would be location, what you want to protect, that's meant by that. Do you have lighting protection system? And that's pretty much it. By location, it's meant where the actual source for damage can come. So for example, if you look at the house, source can come from one source is the DC cables, one will be the signal line, as if you just follow the picture. So that's the um, signal line for the supply of the uh, inverter. And one is for the main distribution board. In reality, be, this this will be connected to the main distribution board. So, so in general, we have it coming from the main transformer, the main supply, and the roof itself. Um, one thing is not as clearly stated, but the one source you can actually see it's the air potential rise from the earth itself, but uh, there's little that can be done there. Anyways, uh, back to the LPS. So if you have lighting protection system, and present or not, that would guide the category for SPD that you want as well. And also, if you if you maintain what we call what it's referred to as a separation distance or not, that will also guide the choice as well. So based on top, usually you have primary and secondary um, SPD. Um, then depends on the SPD present or not, you're going to have type 2 or type 2 and type 1 or what you inside a house and the AC is connected, AC side of the inverter is connected to main switchboard which is connected by an SPD, so source for SPD would not come from there. The only source there from the inverter would be the top, which that means that you need to protect the, the input or the source. Um, there's no uh, light protection system present on the house, which means that automatically looking at type 2 DC protection, search protection device for that specific system. Uh, no in place, calculating separation distance is not as straightforward. A uh, quick graph is shown on the right side there, but it's actually a bit of a complex topic, how you can actually calculate it. Uh, the Lightning Standard does address that. Please refer to the standard. But you know, this, I, would, I would expect this to apply to more commercial systems than residential. On how the actual distance is actually coming into play. So, as we discussed, uh, in general, you're looking at three categories of one to is for DC or AC or DC for PV or not. But Simplifying things, let's say in terms of for DC and inverters, um, when you select, let's say we've decided type 2 SPD device, usually you're looking at nominal discharge current at 5 kA at 820 microseconds characteristic. 
uh, remember the max operating voltage VOC on the SPD needs to be higher than the expected VOC on site. If it's slower, then the, you're risking the SPD activating on, on VOC voltage, which no one wants. Motor protection, this should, uh, with transformerless inverters, we always want that. So it should protect plus to minus, plus to it and minus to this, which basically shunt and series protection modes. Typically, it conductors not related with type 2 directly but that conducts will be 6 mil and the residual voltage you can expect to see somewhere in the range 600 to 200 volts um 2000 volts sorry uh one plus two it's similar obviously the the timing characteristics are a bit different the voltage are a bit different and the earthing uh conductors um uh sizes obviously are um bigger that's because they 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 will take more energy so they need less resistance to take the energy away type 3 is just for general say electronic uh, devices correct me house i will also have to say that because every spd manufacturer can have a different product for same purpose it's best to confirm with the spd manufacturer in place you will see that our SPDs, they're not from this made, but they're actually confirmed to be working with specific SPD manufacturers and tested. But as such, it's the SPD manufacturer that actually drives the actual uh, integration or suitability for the actual inverter itself. We're more than happy to have a look at the actual SPD you have and confirm, but bear in mind, we're not the actual manufacturer. We can only fit to whatever what's, what we have as input on our inverter itself. Okay, um, that was a bit of a bit of lengthy session there, I guess. I'm more than happy to answer any questions if you do have at the end. I'll hand over to my colleague Sam now for the actual Fronius options and solutions that you can have um, with our systems as well. Okay. Um, thank you, Demi, um, for giving us a, um, a very detailed overview on, uh, on the different type of surges. Um, what methods we can use to, um, um, to, to to prevent that from happening with the with the PV system. So in the next few slides, I'm going to cover how to implement um, that solutions uh, with the Fronius inverters and what type of SPDs um, we can install uh, with our residential um, um, with the applications or, or with, the, with the inverters that are used in the residential applications and also the inverters that are used in the commercial applications. Um, so snap uh, inverter series we have uh, with the Fronius Primo 3.2.2, Simo 3.2.8.2 hybrid. Um, we haven't got uh, the SPD available in the market as yet. Uh, we are in the process of finalizing um, a few things um, before we uh, release the SPD um, for that um, uh, inverter series. Um, so to be confirmed, uh, once we have that uh, available in the market, you can purchase uh, the devices from our sales partners. Um, um, yeah, sorry, Sam. Just a bit quickly there. Uh, this has also been driven on demand as well. Um, mm. So the, Sam will explain this in a bit detail. But this product is actually available not for sure in market for other markets, but we there hasn't been well. We haven't seen a lot of. I guess demand for product like that in Australia. So, mm -hmm. if if you feel there's there's a lot of customers that are asking for it, or you want to have it integrated, you want to have this option, please let us know because we can pass this forward and maybe you know expedite this delivery um, in Australia. But we do have a, this product available for our um, Snap Inverter series, mainly used um, for the commercial level applications. Uh, so the Simo inverter series starting from 10 kilowatt power classes to 20 kilowatt and also we do have that uh, SPD device available for our eco inverter series uh, with the power classes starting from 25 kilowatt to 27 kilowatt. Um, so you can certainly order uh, those SPDs uh, from our sales partner for those Simo uh, inverter series and eco inverter series. Um, how to successfully retrofit uh, uh, an SPD device with the Fronius inverter? Uh, we do have a uh, resources available in the form of a quick start guide 
Um, there's a technical data sheet available as well for the SPC devices um, on our websites. Um, I highly recommend it if you would really like to have a visual understanding uh, of how to install uh, an SPD uh, device with a Fronius inverter. You can go to our YouTube channels and also have a look at a quick video tutorials on how to install SPD with the Fronius inverter. Um, but I will cover um, just a few uh, basic steps and, and, and how that can be, uh, SPD can be integrated into the uh, primer inverter series. So what you're seeing here is, is, is a number of steps um, that you can also find in the installation manual uh, with the primer inverter series. It's, it's a very easy um, to install. Um, as you can see uh, here that it, the SPD devices come with the uh, three um, wires or cables um, um, and as you can see how they are actually connected. So we do have a, a provision uh, on the mounting bracket um, where you can uh, fit the SPDs um, on the left hand side of uh, the, the DC um, isolator block. So once you uh, mounted that you can then connect the DC positive for tracker one, DC positive Two for tracker two and then you've got a common DC negative. Uh, what you're seeing uh, on the bottom of the slide here is, um, is a, it's, it's a, a signal input to the inverter. So whenever this SPC device gets activated, the inverter is connected to an internet connection. Okay, so it's quite easy to, to install. Um, as you can see, this um, slide's basically giving us a, a really good understanding on how um, we can install um, with a Primo or, or inverter series. Um, you've got DC positive again to the uh, positive one, positive two, um, and then you've got common um, here. So um, as uh, Demi's um, um, covered in, in the previous slides that we do have a, those uh, DC um, surge arrestor type 1 and 2, uh, mainly for the uh, primary inverters with the multiple tracker. So um, uh, it can be retrofitted um, if um, the requirement changes later on or further down the track in the future. You can also purchase um, SPD device as a retrofit product. Okay. Um, Ordering via wholesalers will be possible once we have that available in the market for the primary inverter series. Um, this uh, is basically showing how to run the signal um, table into the inverter's um, uh, pins. Um, so there is a, um, a provisions where you can sort of connect a couple of those two um, wires coming from the devices into those two pins uh, terminal block. So as I mentioned that if whenever uh, this SPD device get activated you would like to get a, a notifications um, if, if if it's connected to the internet. So basically this picture is on the right hand side is showing how to mount the SPD devices. So what are the um, you know fixation points and, and also um, the connection points on the left hand side of the mounting bracket. Okay. Um, just a quick uh, overview on the data sheets. As you can see, it's sort of mainly um, specified um, what kind of uh, voltage that it can handle. So, maximum operating voltage that it can sort of handle is about 1200 volt DC. So, this is um, uh, DC SPD devices we are covering at the moment, so it can handle up to 1200 volt DC if your, again, um, open circuit voltage is um, is less than that. So then you can definitely go ahead with this um, sort of um, SPD devices. Okay, mechanical indicator. So if it get engaged, you will also see, um, sorry, that there is an LED um, status. You can you can also um, see where it indicates whether it's been engaged or not okay so green is good red is um, it's it's uh, been tricked standard as well so standard compliance these are the standards it's compliant with um, so that's mainly for the um, uh, 
uh, primer in Vota series. The next couple of slides I will cover how to install the SPD devices for um, the bigger inverters or the inverters with the bigger power classes, starting from 10 kilowatt all the way up to 27 kilowatt. Um, again, we do have a two types of SPD available, um, type one plus two, and also you do have the um, DC surge arrestor type two available as well. It's recommended that using a type one plus two because uh, it can also work as a surge arrestor um, as well. So, and that's why it's, it's, it's a slightly more expensive, um, but um, it also it's available as a retrofit kit, so which can be installed again um, in the mounting, inside the mounting bracket of the inverter series. I just want to chip in there a bit. So this is an Eco, um, so you can see you obviously need only one SPD because it's one tracker, and then um, obviously um, with the um, the two tracker, the big inverters with two trackers, uh, there's, there's going to need two SPDs. Thank you. So as you can see here uh, in these pictures, at the moment we only install a one SPD device because it's an eco, eco inverter, uh, and eco inverters only got a one tracker, one MPPD. Um, so that's why we only install the one. But um, if you have the Simo inverters with a two tracker, then you will require to install two SPD devices. Um, but the installers, installation is very uh, method is very similar. Okay. Again, the differences between the type one plus two and um, type two. Um, nominal voltage is also different as well as the maximum operating voltage it can handle is all. So 1060 V DC, whereas the type two is DC. S stands for the single tracker, um, and M is again the multi tracker. Um, so if you have an inverter, you would have to order DC SPD type one plus two slash M, um, and type two slash M as well. So that's the, the major difference there. Um, also, the cross cable sections is also 2.5 mil to 25 mil DC um, cables. As I mentioned uh, um, before, that if you would like to get a, a notifications whenever the SPD device is stripped, um, there are a number of steps. Um, one of the settings that you will have you will have to activate on the inverter display screen. Um, basically, uh, you have to press this third button from the left hand side about five to six times, and um, five zeros will come up. Uh, and then you enter this access code, which is 22742. Um, and once you um, enter that menu, there is a um, setting uh, option called input signal. Um, you select that, you select the mode of operations, and that's the external signal that you would like to, um, to activate. Um, so you go to trigger response, warning, connection type is normally close. Um, so whenever that sort of context will get open, you will uh, receive an email notifications whenever the SPD device is, is activated. Okay, if the inverter is connected um, to the internet. Okay, so this is just the basic menu. You can also make a note of this uh, basic uh, menu access code. Uh, it is 22742. Um, so quick overview again, um, just summary of, of what we covered in these presentations, why it's important to consider the surge protection devices because you know there are some areas in Australia which are prone to lightning strikes. So that's why the considerations of surge protection devices is, is really important in the industry. Um, other point is also we need to consider that if the inverter is um, experiencing failure or it has experienced a failure um, due to the lightning stride, it's not a, a warranty case. Um, so there might be some cost involved if the inverter is damaged by lightning strike. Um, and also there's always a residue risk in spite of the protections measurements, um, which we need to consider. Fronia's inverter with the SPDs, if you, as, as Demi mentions, that we do have a uh, an internal protections in the form of a varista. Um, but uh, if 
um, if if those those inverters is, is fail because of the lightning side, it may not be able to send you the email notification. So installing an external SPD um, that we covered in presentation with the furnace inverter um, may be more uh, useful in terms of um, getting um, notifications uh, for those errors. Okay, if you can implement the signaling contact uh, with the furnace inverter, it's it's you will get notifications. And SPDs and varistors are designed to withstand surges several times, so um, that will also um, enable the installer to save some cost. Um, and inverters won't get damaged um, due to lightning strikes. So maximize safety with the Fronia solutions. Um, you can, like we mentioned before, that because um, it's it's a non-warranty case, um, sometimes installations of the SPDs also uh, are financially sort of viable solutions if you would like to to, to reduce the cost um, after the installations. Uh, if you purchase those SPDs uh, from Fronius, um, I guess it's a single source where you can get the um, the, the whole solutions. Uh, from one shop um, and if you require any support uh, we can also provide you with the technical support uh, when you are installing those SPDs um, from Bronius. And, and I guess the whole point there is that by retrofitting, um, by, by putting the SPDs inside the inverter, like there's no need for external enclosures or any substantial extra labour and it's relatively easy to install the SPDs, residential and commercial as well. So if you think about it, 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 it doesn't really add installation cost yet, but um, it's client DCI isolator anyway, so it, it, it will look nice and neat without any external devices or cabling as such. So in a way, it does present as a complete package, if you will. Which, which obviously, um, if you had to put that externally and add the devices, perhaps you may need fuses, uh, it will be substantial benefit compared to that. Um, we're obviously more than happy to provide support, any guidance, any clarification that may arise there. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, uh, um, do let us know if, if um, if you think this can be beneficial, I guess, in a way, and then um, if you want to purchase or let's see this product available in Australia, because um, the sooner we have more requests, it will be um, sooner placed or deployed in a way, if you will. Yeah, so if you're already considering a SPDs device with any commercial level installations, um, like we mentioned, or residentials, uh, but with the commercials, we do have the product available. Our SPDs are all in the market, so 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 contact our wholesalers um, regarding the purchase of those SPD devices, and I'm sure they will be able to give you an approximate quote. Uh, but like Nimi mentions, we do provide the support um, as well when it comes to the installations. Um, but there are some online resources available, um, such as installations and commissioning guides. Um, you can also go to our YouTube channels, uh, which will um, really uh, uh, give us a uh, visual understanding on how that can be installed with the front-end inverters. So do check it out um, on our website as well as on our YouTube channel. So um, this is the end of the webinar. Um, uh, I thank you uh, for your attendances and um, we're going to be hanging around here for the next uh, 15 minute or so um, and um, answering your questions. So feel free to um, type in your um, questions in the chat box and we will answer those um, questions. Um, Again, do let us know if you have any questions or any um, obviously clarification you may need to be done. Um, feel free. Uh, out of that, uh, this will be, um, this obviously webinar and the um, the slides will be available online. Um, and uh, so those of you who missed the webinar, uh, we have recorded this uh, webinar as well, which will um, then be uploaded to our YouTube channel. Um, so you can also watch it later um, on.
Okay, let's have a look at some question. Okay, some issues with the voice. Obviously, that's not typical now, but um, I guess um, I get. Well, look, um, make it simple. I, I hope that something was learned today, and um, something may have been beneficial. Obviously, again. Um, you're more than welcome to, um, to give us a buzz or contact us. Um, any questions related, I guess um, you can shoot us an email as well. PV, that's uh, email at pv-solutions.australia at frontnews.com and we'll be more than welcome to um, address it and give you a hand if needed as well. All right, well, I hope you liked it and um, that's it. Yeah, so we'll just be here for another uh, 10 minutes also. If you think of uh, any questions, um, just type it in in the chat box and, and then we'll um, answer the questions, okay, for the next five to 10 minutes. Thanks.